Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman, and today's topic is desktop support interview questions and answers. If you're a fan of my channel, I'm sure you're already aware that I already do have this type of uh, video which is called Top 20 Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers, and I'm glad to mention that it has helped a lot of people um, get their jobs, and uh, this is something that I get all the time. People message me and say thank you so much for you know, helping me because most of these questions were presented to them during the interview and I'm certainly more than happy to assist and to me this is one of the best ways to help out all of the people in the world when it comes to job assistance right so this video is going to be based off of this one this specific video which is called top 20 desktop support interview questions and answers um, this specific one was posted one year ago and it has 114,000 views uh, which is awesome of course but specifically designed for mobile phones. Meaning, as you can see here, this video is an, in portrait mode. So if you're watching this on a mobile phone and you're just holding your phone as, as normal as you can see here, um, your video is going to be in perfect portrait mode, meaning it's specifically designed for mobile phones. So in addition to covering this video, uh, we're going to read it together and follow along. Um, this is going to be based off a written version as well, a written version of the same video that is located on CosmicNovo.com. So if we go to CosmicNovo.com and scroll all the way down, you will find a information technology tag, which is exactly where we're going to go now. Information technology, select there. And then as you can see here, I already have a bunch of different uh, articles on this website related to information technology that are certainly educational and you're more than welcome to read this but we're going to scroll down and look specifically for desktop support interview questions and answers so we can do this together and of course i will have a link to this specific article with written questions in the description box below so if you would uh, if you want a quicker way to get to this point, you can certainly do so. Just look down, right? <laughs> now, just to mention, if you'd prefer to just go to this link and select the play button here for this video, you can certainly do so. Whether you're doing this on a mobile phone, on your desktop, on your laptop, on your tablet, you can certainly do so and follow along. It'll be the same difference. But in this case, like I said, I'm specifically making this for a mobile version, which should make it easier um, for most people and i'm thinking to myself basically most people in the world um, have access to their phones and in my opinion and i believe this is a, a fact um, that most users um, that are using the internet for whatever reason whether it's watching youtube just reading something on the internet are using their phone this is a fact even google itself is moving towards mobile and hence this is why i'm making this as well Okay, so let's get to it. First question is, can you tell me about yourself? Be very careful when answering this question because this is your first big chance to impress and you can do so by stating the facts related to this job. Only talk about previous experience, education, and formal training related to this field. It is important to understand that follow-up questions may be related to anything you say at this point. As you can see, just from this very first question, is that I've tailored all the answers accordingly, uh, meaning that I try to put as much information information as I can um, that, that you can use in order to answer these type of questions, you know, and in as, as, short as, as short of a manner as possible, right? So I believe this one is thoroughly explained, so let's go ahead and move on. Question number two. You've received a trouble ticket that monitor is not working. What is the first thing that you should do? The thing you should do is check to see if all cables are plugged in correctly. First check power, the video signal cable. If both, if both check out, make sure that the computer itself is powered on. If asked for further troubleshooting steps, explain that there is a possibility that video driver or PC hardware could be causing the issue, right? So let's say in real life, you do get this ticket, you go to this computer, and of course, um, you would check 
you know make sure everything's plugged in make sure that everything's turned on the basic stuff this is one of those very very basic questions but there's a really high chance that you will be asked this you know because interviewers do ask these type of questions just to kind of cut to the chase if you will starting uh, most of the time starting from basics and then moving on to a little bit more difficult stuff okay so moving on to question number three what is safe mode how do you get to it and what is it used for in order to reach safe mode computer must be restarted and by pressing F8 key before the operating system loads, right? Uh, you will arrive at the you will arrive at the selection screen, which you will scroll up to select safe mode. Safe mode is used to troubleshoot driver issues, hardware issues, and remove viruses or unwanted software. Now, I do want to add to this: in Windows 10, it's slightly different. You have to go through menus and tell it to actually boot up in troubleshooting mode. Once you reboot, you will get to a menu where you can navigate to the safe mode. So in Windows 10, it's slightly different. Keep that in mind. Um, okay, so moving on, let's go to the question number four. What is an IP address and how to find it? IP address is a number assigned to your computer to identify its existence, location, on a network, meaning that DHCP server will assign a number to each computer connected to a network as part of identification. You can find your IP address by opening opening a command prompt windows CMD, also known as CMD, and type in ipconfig forward slash all. Alternatively, you can look at the network adapter properties. So basically, in the nutshell, IP address is a number assigned to your computer by the network right the network needs to know what is this computer and and if they can't realize what it is it they give it a name and that name would be a number if you will right it says okay your new computer connected to this network i'm going to give you a number so that i know that you're there that way i have a way to identify you specifically as this computer right and the, the way network would actually know that your computer is different from other computers on the network is based off the mac address right mac address is basically um, identifier for your piece of hardware that is connected to the network so all the network interface cards will have their own specific mac address and there are no mac address uh, there are no same MAC addresses in the world, so your computer will have a specific MAC address that no other computer will have, uh, no matter what. Okay. Uh, moving on to the question number five: What is a default gateway? You can see what the default gateway is by for, uh, excuse me. You can see what the default gateway is by performing an ipconfig um, forward slash all command through CMD. Default gateway serves as a path to reach other networks. For example, in order to reach the internet outside of your business or home, you need a gateway that will open the way for you. Default gateway in a business env environment is typically a proxy server. So a gateway, the name itself kind of gives it away. You basically need a door, if you will, just to kind of try and explain it as in, in a simpler manner, right? It's, it's basically a door that tells your computer okay this is how you get from your network to other networks you know so the you're you're connected to your let's say home network or a business network it's going to be have its own network but if you want to reach the internet which is another network you have to have a gateway um, for it right you have to have a door that you will open that your computer will open to find its way right that's my simple way of explaining this specific one Moving on to number six, what is Active Directory? Active Directory is a feature Windows Server operating system, and it contains user accounts, object, host names, group policies, and domain services. For example, Active Directory will have information about a user login credentials. In addition, it can contain group policy that will apply different permissions to user accounts that belong to specific groups within organization within a domain so simply put once you let's say you get this job 
let's say you get this job and you start working at this company first thing that they will do is create a login for you so you can log into a computer right all their computers will be connected to a network which is controlled by a domain which is a also known as the main controller the main controller has this active directory of users within it so person that sets up your login information will go to inside of the active directory and say okay let's say this is Bob and Bob Jackson will have a new account and they go inside of the active directory and they plug in your name and then decide okay which which organization or which department is Bob going to be working in so basically they take your name and they assign it to that group and that that basically creates a login for you and from there they can set up more you know more uh, different permissions different um, different type of uh, group policies and whatnot but this is one of those network um, administrator type of videos which I certainly do have on my channel so if you'd like to um, check that out you can certainly do so um, I do also have a written version which is located at CosmicNova.com in the same section here and I also have it on youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. Um, okay, so moving on. Question number seven. What is a domain? Domain is a group of computers and users connected to a network, right? So you can have multiple domains on the same network um, that are controlled by the domain controller, right? So uh, domain controller being the active directory, right? So you can have multiple domains connected to a, to the network. Network itself is the is the physical part of it the main is is basically a virtual part of it of network that has all of these um, you know login accounts different host names uh, different host names meaning computer names so let's say you connect a new computer um, to a network you have to assign it to a, a domain so it can be part of that domain this is kind of where the host name uh, part of it comes in uh, PC host names you can see here must be added to the same domain right so that way you can access the same features as the people as, as the users of that domain right just like just like your personal login for this domain uh, computer name has to be added the same way through Active Directory right I hope um, I hope you guys can understand this answer um, it's sometimes it's really hard to um, simplify things that can't be simplified without losing a meaning so I'm sure you guys understand that uh, but if you just kind of uh, uh, understand that in a way where domain is just a virtual place that contains all of this information then you would kind of uh, have a better understanding of what domain is and how Active Directory comes as, as part of domain right and again I do have a network administrator a video that you can check out Okay, moving on. Question number eight. You receive a trouble ticket that says my printer is not working properly. It prints out weird pattern on paper. Please assist. And this issue is caused by a bad or wrong printer driver. Solution is to acquire or install correct printer driver. So let's say you do get this ticket. You go to this person or you contact them. Depends how your, um, how your business is set up. Um, you can let's say you go to their desk personally and they say hey I you know it, it works but it's just everything looks weird like there's just weird pattern it doesn't look typical as in like your printer uh, is running out of ink you can see that it fades out you know that, that that one is pretty obvious and plus you would most likely have a warning on your printer driver that the link that the, that the ink is running out but not in a business environment right this mo most likely would not be the case in a business environment you would have to go to the printer itself to see whether it actually running out of ink but in this case it's just printing out a weird pattern it just looks like gibberish on paper that's just a bad printer driver right and the solution is to reinstall the printer all right so let's move on to question number nine what are some commonly used LAN cables there are four different types of LAN cables, CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6, and CAT6A, right? And I have to stress out here that these are commonly used LAN cables. 
Um, there are of course more or different types of line cables, not just four, but these are the most commonly used, right? If you, if they if they ask you about the speed, Cat5 speeds are up to 100 megabits per second. Cat5e up to 1,000 megabits per second. Cat6 up to 1,000 megabits certified gigabit. And of course, I want to go back to here a little bit just to kind of explain. Cat5e up to 1,000 megabits per second. That means that E can Cat5 can possibly go up to this speed, but it's not guaranteed. However, Cat6 is certified gigabit, which means it's guaranteed 1,000 megabits per second, right? Of course, there are other factors which I will get into slightly later here. And Cat6A up to 10,000 megabits per second, right? All these speeds are based off 100 meters in distance, right? So all of these speeds will depend on the quality of the cables. And generally speaking, beyond 100 meters in distance, the speed drops and fades away, right? This is why this is here, right? So all of these speeds will depend on the quality of the cables, whether they're shielded, how well they're designed, all of these type of things, but these are uh, potential uh, maximum speeds that each one of these can reach, right? Okay, so moving on to question number 10. What is blue screen of death? Um, you guys probably have seen this where your computer, your computer just crashes and there's a blue screen. Um, blue screen of death is mostly com most commonly caused by bad hardware. The error appears as blue screen crashing the computer. Blue screen of death can be caused by hardware, software, or driver issues and conflicts. Um, in order to troubleshoot blue screen of death, you will need to run full hardware diagnostic on the PC and update all of the drivers, right? So there are many things that can cause this, most commonly caused by hardware, software, or driver issues and conflicts, right? Um, most of the time that I've seen from personal experience, it's been hardware issues, you know? Um, sometimes software, but mostly hardware shoots. Usually, what I found personally was hard drive going bad, but most of the time it was the RAM, random access memory going bad. So um, you can test this by basically, if you have multiple RAMs in your computer, uh, RAM chips, you can take one out and see if the issue persists, and then, or and, and you know, vice versa, swap them out. Or you can just run hardware uh, diagnostic, run a hardware diagnostic, on all of these components. You can specifically run hard drive diagnostic for hard drives or or, uh, or for your RAM, for your random access memory, or even as, as far as, you know, your motherboard, your chipset. You can test all of these things. Question number 11, what is DHCP? DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol and it deals with handling of IP addresses for all computers connected to a network. Each computer is allowed to have um, connection to the network or internet resources after DHCP assigns an IP address dynamically, meaning that it's random and it can change. Dynamically means it's random and it can change at any point. Dynamic type of IP address can change at any point, right? So, uh, okay, so I, uh, I kind of, <laughs> I guess I kind of predicted myself or something uh, or something like that. Okay, guys, I mean, this kind of goes back to our uh, question of what is an IP address? Where did we have this? Here we go. What is an IP address, right? We know that, I, that IP address is a number that your computer receives after it connects to a network. Well, the HCP server um, deals with this. It has the ability to assign these numbers to your computer. So let's say your computer has an IP address of 166.0.0.1, right? The next computer that connects to this network, the dynamic host configuration protocol server, um, will, the HCP server will assign the next available IP address, which is 166.0.0.2. You see where I'm getting with this? Of course, this is a physical part of the network and um, this will be uh, handled. Uh, for example, let's say you have a router at home. You have a router and you have multiple computers connected to that, whether it's wirelessly or physically, it doesn't matter. Your uh, 
router has a built-in um, DHCP server, and that DHCP server decides, you know, which, you know, the addresses, which numbers are assigned to each computer that are connected to it. There you go. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, question number 12. What is DNS? DNS stands for Domain Name System and reroutes known host names to IB addresses um, that um, host its service. For example, DNS for www. Uh, let me go back. For example, DNS for www.microsoft.com is located at 104.90. Uh, let me go back again. I apologize. For example, DNS for www. Microsoft.com is located at 104.90.84.14, but it can change randomly, right? So this kind of goes back to, uh, you know, kind of goes back to whether this is controlled by DHCP or not. Most likely not, unless, you know, uh, unless Microsoft decides to change this address and, you know, it's just rerouted to it. But typically, this will be a static address, static IP address, which remains the same all the time. Um, you could say that it serves um, as an address book for the host names, which is, uh, which are then translated into numbers, um, in order for computers to understand it. Um, in this example, it assigns and routes web addresses names to web hosting services. So to make it simpler to understand, DNS basically takes this name www.microsoft.com I'm sorry I have uh, for some reason I have trouble saying three W's in a, in a row uh, microsoft.com and translates into a number right so instead of you having to type this number this IP address each time you want to go to microsoft.com you can just type in microsoft.com that's what DNS does that's the simplest way of translating it right uh, so so instead of dealing having to deal with translation like uh, the the computer itself you know takes all these binary binary commands that it has and translates them into this for us and uh, but it didn't give us ability to just use a name you know i hope i hope that one's clear guys i really do okay moving on uh what is a vpn what is vpn right a virtual private network is commonly used um, as a secure way to connect from remote location to network resources in your business or company. Um, for example, you can take your laptop to a coffee shop, start a VPN, and through, its, and through it securely connect to a PC at work or access companies' emails and files. Now, it's so, okay, so this is a simple answer to what this is, and you can certainly say this, but if you want to elaborate and give it uh, more thought, um, if requested by the interviewer, um, you can say that if you go to a coffee shop, um, you will have an ability um, to uh, basically set up a private network, private uh, uh, encrypted network on your on your laptop. So you take your laptop to a coffee shop, you sit down, you get some coffee, and now you're like, okay, I want to connect to the works computer because I have some files over there, but you're your works network, which where, where your computer is, or your, your work computer is, um, doesn't let you just connect to it. You know, it has to know that you're encrypted and that you're allowed to safely connect to their network because, you know, they're worried that somebody might hack in. As simple as that. So you create a virtual private network. This is usually done with software, right? You have a software, you launch it, you launch this software, and this software knows the location of the network for your company so it tries to connect to it right it tries to connect to it but in the meantime it wants you to authenticate meaning that it wants to know who are you why would you want to connect to our network so it asks you most likely for a pin or a password or such and that way it will know that you're allowed to connect to this company's network and will create a tunnel if you will um, but virtual where the virtual private networks uh, comes in is that at your coffee shop the little connection that you make will be encrypted and that's called virtual private network you know so and then it once you authenticate once you give it proper access it lets you connect to the company's network and then you can access all your files on your computer that's located at your company right there you go uh number 14 
What is a ping command and its use? Generally, the ping command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. Um, through command prompt, um, type www.microsoft.com. This function sends, or I should say, I apologize, type in ping www.microsoft.com. Um, this function sends four packets of data which are sent back as acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement of successful connection. It also provides the latency results measured in milliseconds, right? So what happens is you type in, it doesn't have to be Microsoft.com. You can type in, uh, let's say, www the ping. Okay, so you go to command prompt, you open up your command prompt, you, the first thing you do is just type in, type ping, and then it could be anything else. So let's say it's www.cosmicnova.com. Once you hit enter, it will send these packets to the server um, where you're trying to ping the server you're trying to ping and will provide an answer whether it, whether you're actually able to reach it or not and it would uh, basically tell you whether it was successful or not it's kind of self-explanatory when you try it out and I actually encourage you to actually pause um, this video right now and go to your command prompt and do this see what kind of results you have um, this is one of the reasons I uh, am making videos like this, so you guys can follow along, you know, and, and kind of uh, learn like that. And I try to explain as much as I can, guys. I really do. And, of course, just to kind of point out again, uh, this uh, the article to this is, uh, is going to be in the description box below. Uh, okay, so moving on. Um, okay, you know what? Let me just kind of go back to here. Basically, the purpose of this is to basically let you know whether you can reach this destination by typing ping whatever the address you're trying to reach. This basically is used to resolve network issues. This is one of the basic steps uh, on resolving network connection issues, whether you can actually reach the destination or not. You know, you may not be asked any further than this when it comes to desktop support, uh, but this is basically this is the basic knowledge that you were that you expected to know when dealing with desktop support. You know, so let's say, OK, let's say a user comes to you and says, OK, I can't reach Microsoft.com. The first thing you do is see if you can reach it. And if you can't, then you can see if you can ping it. And then you type in, you know, ping um, Microsoft.com. And then you can see, you know, where what the issue is. You know, this is the, these are the first steps of network troubleshooting. OK, so question number 15, what is a group policy? Active Directory assigns a group policy to each new user added into the database. For example, if you work in desktop support, your user login credentials and permissions will be assigned to a group policy. In Active Directory, you can take any user and place them into a group that has predetermined settings. Group policy can restrict read, write, or execute uh, permissions and restrict access to network resources. So let's say we, we say you're Bob Jackson, right? We're going back, going back to the Bob Jackson example. You know, he's added to the Active Directory, and now we know that Bob Jackson is part of desktop support, so we put him into a group called desktop support. This group will have predetermined um, settings that allow him to do certain things. Okay, this is what the group policy is. It, it basically um, tells um, your login credentials, your login information, let's say you log in as Bob Jackson, um, it will basically tell the domain, okay, Bob Jackson, according to this group policy, has all of these permissions, whether it's to install programs, read, write, add certain things, add printers, all these type of things. This is what group policy is. Okay, let's move away from Bob Jackson to question number 16. What is a PST, .pst file, also known as PST file, or just a PST? .pst is a file extension used by Microsoft Outlook archive file. An email archive uh, would commonly be known as a PST, right? So you go to Outlook, and let's say you have so many emails that you ran out of space in your inbox, you're going to create a PST, you're going to create an archive. In, in Outlook, it's not going to be called PST. Uh, basically, you would, it would be called archive. So you go in there, 
you navigate through your Outlook and then you create a um, archive archive um, and its extension will be .pst and for this archive of course you can drag all of your emails into it you, you take your emails and then you put them into this archive file right and within this archive you can actually create subfolders called you can name one inbox you can name one uh, outbound deleted whatever you want it's almost you can essentially make a copy of your inbox but this PST and, and it gives it the .pst extension for this archive. This is how you would differentiate from um, just a regular uh, Microsoft inbox file, which is called OST, right? It's different. OST is temporarily stored on your computer. Um, you can also look this up under your local profile. It's, it's called .ost. But this one um, kind of follows you around because it's part of the server. It's located in a server. It's just that it's done, you know, temporarily downloaded um, as part of your inbox. .pst is stored locally on your computer, and it's an archive file, right? I think I've explained this one pretty well, guys. Um, so yeah, moving on to the question number seventeen. How would you change folder permissions? You can change folder permissions through group policy, but it can also be done at local level with the administrator privileges. Under Folder Properties, select Security tab and then Edit button, after which a pop-up will provide the ability to add users and allow for read, write, execute, or full permissions. So let me explain this a little bit further. Folder permissions. Um, let's say you come across a folder or a file that you find somewhere, let's say on a server somewhere, let's say you're browsing through and you need a certain file and you're like okay here's this file i found it on the server you know this server located you know somewhere and this file um i need to edit i need to make changes to i need to make some make some changes to but it, it won't let you you know it won't let you it says you don't have the appropriate permissions to make changes you know you know you don't you don't have the permission to change it. you're you're just not allowed well, this is how you would add the ability to um, grant these permissions so you can read, so you can read, write, and execute, right? You would go under folder properties, right? You select security tab, and then you select the edit button. After that, a pop-up will provide the ability to add users that will allow read, write, and execute, right? In that pop-up, what you would do is basically type in the name that you use to log into the computer. But let's say you're adding it for somebody else. Let's say you want somebody else to have the ability to, um, you know, make these, you know, changes to this file. You would add their login name for that domain. So let's say it's Bob. Let's say it's Bob Jackson. You would type in in this pop-up. Within this pop-up, you would just type in Bob Jackson. And when you click OK, you will have the ability to check all these things. It says read, write, execute, or full permissions. Once you select all those things, you click OK. And now this person has the ability to make changes. You know, as simple as that. That's what folder permissions are. Okay, moving on to question number 18. What is a difference between a switch and a hub? Okay, um, this is a simple answer to this. There are a couple of main differences between switch and a hub. Hub can be used to connect multiple computers to a single network, while switch can be used to create multiple segments of the same network. Um, second difference is that with a hub, all computers connected to, a, to it receive the data packets at once, which can create latency issues. Switch can regulate this by only sending data, data packets to computer that requested it, right? So this is one of those uh, questions that are kind of difficult explain verbally but um, basically hub uh, let me start with hub hub is an older format hubs are came before switches hubs uh, basically um, so think of it as a router right you, you have a router I'm talking about not as in a router and it is in its function but more like the way it's shaped right you have a bunch of different connections you've seen this right you have this you know piece of equipment has a bunch of connectors right and let's say it's a hub and you connect a bunch of computers to it right um, hub 
doesn't know that um, doesn't know that uh, doesn't know a good way, if you will, to distribute the bandwidth between all those computers, right? So let's say one of these computers that are connected to the hub wants to download something or uh, copy something over from a server that you know you know let's say a really large file or a folder and it tries to copy all this data from a server and this hub doesn't know that it, that it needs to distribute the bandwidth across all of these computers that are connected to it so it only it gives a full power full 100 let's say 100 megabits uh, let's say that's the, that's the speed limit 100 megabits connection to this one computer that's trying to copy all this stuff so now all these computers that are connected to this hub will slow down because this one computer is trying to copy all this stuff at once you know and it, it will give it a full power it will give it a full bandwidth and now you know everybody is slowing down because this one computer is asking demanding all this for a long time you know because you're trying to copy something large and it's going to take forever and this is why it's going to be noticeable because hub just doesn't know any better right it will give you full power regardless to other computers right now let's go back to switch switch being modern and this is what's used in modern networks and your router itself is actually a switch right it's going to look just like it um, very similar and maybe just larger in a business environment right but it's your router your home router is a switch essentially and it allows um it, well, it can regulate um, all the data packets that are, you know, sent back and forth. So instead of, um, so instead of um, just allowing this one computer that's trying to copy all these files, that's trying to copy all these files from a God knows what server, um, instead of, uh, you know, just being able to give it all full power, it can actually regulate this and allow other computers on the network to benefit from the same speed, right? So it allows multiple computers to run at full speed as opposed to a hub that can only allow one computer to run at full speed, you know. This is one of those things that are kind of difficult to explain. But if you're asked this question, just kind of make sure to stick to this simple answer that I've provided here without trying to explain it any further. Because this is one of those questions that are really difficult to explain, you know. Just kind of, uh, uh, just kind of, uh, you know tread carefully on this one okay moving on to question number 19 how would you recover data from virus infected computer in order to successfully and safely recover data you would extract the hard drive from the infected computer so you would take the hard drive out of a computer that's infected slave it to a second computer that has updated virus definitions updated microsoft patches and drivers right this is very important, right? You want to have um, antivirus software that has updated virus definitions before you take this hard drive and plug it into a second computer as a secondary hard drive, meaning slave it. Um, you want to make sure that you have updated virus definition for this antivirus, or maybe even you know, install another antivirus software so that obviously we can detect what the issue is, right? We can scan it afterwards. And of course, they have Microsoft patches installed, meaning that if there's a vulnerability and it's an exploit of Microsoft operating system, for example, um, you want to make sure that you have the current patch that resolves this issue if it's a virus that you're dealing with, right? And of course, you want to have updated drivers, right? From there, you would scan the drive for viruses, and once the virus is moved, you can extract data that needs to be recovered. So. Don't start copying data over without getting rid of the virus first. Because, you know, you don't want to copy the virus over. Right? You want to make sure that the virus is found and uh, terminated, if you will, before you copy over all the data that you need to recover. Right? Uh, never, um, I, I personally wouldn't, in a business environment, even after you clean it, even after you get rid of the virus, um, do not use this. A hard drive as the main um, source of for the operating system right meaning don't use it as a C drive right I would I would format it regardless you just want to get the data you just want the data that 
that you need. You cover that and just format it, format it, get rid of that thing, you know. And last question here, um, why should we hire you? Why should we hire you, right? This is your last chance to sell yourself to this employer, right? Mention all the qualifications related to this job, all the work experience, all the education certificates that you may have. Don't forget to smile, make eye contact, and confidently explain why all these things would make you a perfect candidate. Um, as an addition, okay, well, this is the last part of it, and I'll certainly read that. So why should we hire you? You know, this is your last chance. Make sure that you mention anything that you haven't mentioned, that you really want to mention that, that is related to this. And when you get to this point and they ask you, why should we hire you? There's a really good chance that they are considering you for this job. You know what I mean? They wouldn't get to this point. You wouldn't get to the question number 20, right? Um, you would not be at this position if they weren't considering you for this job, at least one of the top candidates. So you want to mention um, even if it's the uh, same thing as you've mentioned from the first question here, the first question being, can you tell me about yourself, you know? Make sure they, they know all of, all of these things, all of the work experience that you have, right? All of the education that's related, you know, smile. They, of course, they're going to hire somebody who's smile, who's friendly. You know, you want to leave a good impression. Why would they hire somebody who's, who's full on themselves, you know, who uh, sounds a little bit egotistic, you know? Or anything like that you know you don't want any negative uh, negative uh, feedback to them you don't want to give them any ne negative feedback or at least you know even if it's something that you think you know may sound okay you have to be very careful because you'd be surprised 50% of the time as much as 50% of the time I should say that because I can't say for sure 50% of the time but as much as 50% of the time people get hired just because they're nice you know but of course Mention all this stuff, all the work experience, all the education, all the certificates that you may have, right? You know, so as an addition to this video, uh, you just want to mention how it's very important to do your research about the company you're applying for, right? That goes without saying. Research this company ahead of time, ahead of time, because um, chances are you will actually go through an HR, human resources, uh, human resources um, questions and answers, which I uh, certainly do have a video on that. So if you want to actually and and look that up, I can't think of it at the top of my head. But if you go to my channel, um, YouTube uh, YouTube.com forward slash Kobelman, um, I have a video there somewhere. And of course, I have a bunch of different other um, interview questions and answers related to other stuff. For example, in this article, I have a link to that ten most common interview questions and answers. Um, this will help you with that HR part of it if you go here and I also have top 20 system administrator interview questions and answers that's if you're going into the system administrator uh, position if you're applying for a system administrator uh, position I should say and uh, let me just go back here real quick and I just kind of point out some of the other things that I do have available in the information technology tab uh, let's see here. I mean, I made so many articles and videos that sometimes you forget what you all, what all you have. Let's see here. Here we go. Top 20 network administrator questions, interview questions and answers. If you'd like to check that out, I certainly have that as well. Um, it goes into networking part of it. Uh, and uh, let's see here. There's a system administrator in Microsoft interview questions and answers. And here's the top 10 most common interview questions and answers. And again, on my YouTube channel, I have a bunch of different things. Some videos that are combined to kind of help you deal with the uh, multiple aspects of it. For example, this one is desktop support and help desk. So it's, it's two in one. And they have help desk and customer service. And here's the uh, system administrator one too. And, and so, on for, so on and so forth. And of course, I have so many other things on this channel that you can learn from a lot of a lot of different you know a lot of different uh, things that you can learn um, and have some random stuff too uh, <laughs> unboxing and you know just having fun you know Windows 10 tutorials some PC for beginner stuff software interviews software reviews this is some of, some of my older older stuff too you know if you want to check that out feel free to do so if you like my stuff tell friends about it subscribe like you know the usual I'm not gonna bore you with that type of stuff guys but 
you know, I just wanted to help you and create this, uh, this awesome video for you guys so you can watch it on mobile. You know, thank you so much. Good luck to you guys. Bye-bye.